and welcome everyone to today's event, Financing Long-Term Strategies, Are Least Developed Countries and Funders Align. I hope you are all doing great today and ready for a very interesting conversation. I am now absolutely delighted to introduce Claire Shakia, IID's Director of Climate, who will be our moderator today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Georgina. Welcome everyone. Delighted you're all able to join us today. Um, uh, well, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you are. I'm Claire Sakia, and as um, Georgina said, I'm moderating today. I'm the director of the Climate Change Group at IID. Um, so this webinar on financing long-term strategies will explore whether the expectations um, from the least developed countries are being met in terms of finance for developing and delivering long-term strategies for climate action in their countries. With the latest IPCC report making frightening frighteningly clear the devastating impacts of human-caused greenhouse gas emissions, the need for a rapid and just global transition away from fossil fuels and towards low-carbon climate-resilient societies has never been clearer. The least developed countries, the LDCs, are amongst the most vulnerable to climate change despite contributing the least to its cause. Understood too well, understand too well the urgency for immediate action as well as long-term planning to address the climate crisis. And under the Paris Agreement, we all agreed that parties should strive to formulate and communicate long-term low greenhouse gas emission development strategies. And these have now become known as the long-term strategies. These strategies are not only important for high emitting countries to set out the plans for a swift and just transition away from fossil fuels, but they can also provide many benefits for LDCs, even with neg negligible emissions and support aligning existing and new policies and measures across all societies and um, across the whole of society, across all sectors with the long-term goals. So far, just one LDC, Benin, has submitted a long-term strategy to the UNFCCC, recognizing the value of developing an L um, a, one of these strategies for their governments, a number of other LDCs in the process of developing their own, including Bhutan and the Gambia. There's not a lot of experience to draw from as other LDCs face the daunting challenge of developing one of these strategies for addressing climate change in their countries. But a lot can be learned from each other. So today we aim to gather input and perspectives from LDCs and other stakeholders on what is needed to address LDCs' unique challenges in developing their long-term strategies. Long-term strategies are nationally determined based on national priorities for addressing climate change. And this means, particularly for LDCs, they're not solely focused on mitigation, but feature strategies um, for enhancing adaptive capacity, strengthening resilience and reducing vulnerability to climate change. As I've said, the LDCs contributed only a tiny proportion of the global greenhouse gases to date and will need support to develop their economies and lift people out of poverty without following the traditional high emitting development pathways of the past, while also adapting communities to changing climate and building resilience against the inevitable and worsening impacts of climate change. Climate finance and global solidarity and cooperation will be critical to achieving the goals of the Paris Agreement. And it's been noted in the past that climate finance is often not predictable or sustainable. Long-term strategies need to be matched with long-term funding um, approaches and a strong and stable climate finance architecture is central to delivering the scale of resources required to achieve countries' um, objectives within their long-term strategies. But are the priorities and needs of LDCs aligned with these international finance institutions? Today, we hear from our esteemed panel with representatives from the LDCs, research institutes and development banks to explore whether expectations are aligned for financing long-term strategies in LDCs. The webinar will cap capture diversity of experiences and analyze lessons from across the LDC group which will enable deeper understanding and awareness of best practice. So let me now begin to introduce the speakers. Firstly, we have Isitu Kamara, who is a deputy director in the Gambian Ministry of Finance and Economic Affairs. She has 10 years experience in development planning and has been negotiating outcomes on climate finance for the least developed countries under the UNFCCC since 2014. Alpha Jallo is the director of the Climate Change Secretariat and the UNFCCC focal point in the Gambia's Ministry of Environment, Climate Change and Natural Resources. And we also have Davina Milenge Uwela, who is the Principal Programme Coordinator at the African Development Bank. Neha Muhi, who is a Senior Climate Change Specialist at the World Bank. And Cynthia Elliott, who is an Associate at the Global Climate Programme at the World Resources Institute. Thank you all for joining us. I'm looking forward to this panel greatly. 
So if I start off by asking um, a first question to Isatu and Alpha from The Gambia, um, what are the financing challenges and opportunities for developing long-term strategies? And what would you, how would you describe the status of progress towards your own country's long-term strategy? Isatu, Alpha. Thank you, Claire. Good afternoon to everyone. It is a pleasure to be here to participate in another IED webinar on the critical topic of financing long-term strategies. Um, in responding to the question, I would like to highlight two, two primary financing challenges to developing long-term strategies. Um, first would be the issue of rising proportion of public climate finance on loan basis. Um, unfortunately, the Gambia and most LDCs are currently in debt distress. And the fact that an increasing proportion of public climate finance is being provided on loan basis is a major impediment to financing LTS. So for instance, um, the Gambia's current debt distress is high and it's deemed unsustainable. Hence the country has limited space for additional borrowing. And this has had an impact on the current national development plans implementation. Um, for example, the grants accounted for 40% of the total 1.7 billion pledges by developed countries, and with loans accounted for the remaining 60%. As a result, um, the national development plans implementation could not be fully realized due to constraints on the amount of resources the country could borrow. Um, and this phenomenon is not only unique to the Gambia, um, as debt levels in developing countries are at an all-time high. As a result, um, unless increasing proportion of public climate finance on loan basis is reversed um, to grants, many LDCs, including the Gambia, will have limited access to resources to implement long-term strategies. Um, secondly, is the unmatched and unmet climate finance targets. Um, statistics has shown that the volume of resources required for developing countries to adapt to and mitigate the effects of climate change far exceeds the available resources, um, implying that resources required and those available for climate action are unmatched. Um, besides this as well, um, the 100 billion um, goal by year by 2020 has sadly been a broken promise. Um, hence, delivering the 100 billion target from now on would demonstrate a strong commitment to Axon, and it is a critical step towards rebuilding trust as well. Um, and this, this, and this could also provide the moment, momentum for establishing the new climate finance goal, which must be science-based, in order that to, in order to ensure that the resources required for climate action, including long-term strategies, are accommodated. Um, on the financing opportunities, um, I think the alignment of the Gambia's long-term climate vision with the NDC and upcoming development planning documents, such as the National Development Vision and the Recovery Plan, which we are, we are um, about to formulate, um, are important steps towards a more coordinated implementation of the Paris Agreement. So this alignment will um, help to accelerate the process of fully integrating climate objectives into strategies, such as, such, such as those of um, multilateral development banks in a way that better supports the needs and priorities of countries. And finally, the early involvement of development partners will also help to ensure that um, government and development partner interventions on climate change are in sync. So I, I'll leave it at that for now and I'll let Alpha also respond. Thank you, Claire. Thank you so much. It's still, you've raised some very important points. Alpha, please. Uh, uh, thank you and thank you, Isidu, for, for, for those uh, thoughtful thoughts. Uh, uh, I just will be intervening um, in saying that uh, our biggest challenge is um, increasing the resource base of climate financing. Uh, as, as it stands, um, it's GCF, which has a 50% adaptation, 50% uh, mitigation, and that 50% is now divided between uh, with, with all uh, for all developing countries. So that's a challenge, the challenge of increasing the resource base 
of, uh, uh, of climate finances. Uh, the other challenge is uh, trying to co-divorce the climate uh, change adaptation from development orientation, uh, uh, development also uh, uh, development because other funders will say that uh, other infrastructure development is for national development and it's not related to climate uh, climate development. But for developing countries, I think all of them are, 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 are linked. You cannot address climate change adaptation without addressing other infrastructure development. In our NDP, we have a um, climate proof infrastructure and that refers to infrastructure that are prone to climate disasters like uh, uh, erosion of our roads, especially uh, narrow, uh, narrow uh, drainage system that car can carry out the volume of, uh, of, uh, of uh, flooding in our residential area. So to take up those kind of uh, development, other donors will say that no, that is your national development, your national budget should, uh, should, should take it on board. Whilst on, on our side, it is all related, related to climate change, impacts that is affecting uh, our residential areas in terms of flooding and bad infrastructure of our roofs, which are very low, flat roofs, and uh, it's difficult to, to manage them when it comes to only tar roofs. Every year, our tar roofs are, are, are destroyed due to rainfall or in high intensity roofs. Now you can go around within the urban areas, the roofs are very bad, but next two, three months after they have been repaired after rains, it's a different thing. So we need this climate proof infrastructure to, to, to build for the, our road network. But the, the, our main challenge is diversity from it from the, our main development targets. Yeah. So the other aspect aspect is a uh, as is a uh, uh, that I want to inform you in terms of opportunity is that we are organizing a, a meeting, a breakfast meeting with some of the donor uh, donor communities or or, or donor or, or donor organization on Thursday, twenty first of this month at the Kairaba Avenue to see how they can fund our implementation of our NDC, which also include the the the, the uh, adaptation in it so i think uh, this is what i want to add what i should have said until we go to the next section thank you thank you so much alpha so some really some really challenging issues that you're facing there um that you've both laid out with um so much of your climate finance coming as a loan and you've got already an unsustainable debt burden um and that the 100 billion climate finance commitment must be met to build trust um, the, the, the amount of resources at the moment has to be divided amongst so many that it's really small amounts that are coming for each one. And this issue around that development is now in the, in the context of a changed climate. So the presumption should be that this that climate finance don't have to prove it's being additional because you're already working within this changed climate trying to develop. Um, and then the positives of the long term strategy alignment with the national development vision and recovery plan and also your efforts to coordinate donors behind your plans. Thank you so much. My turn now to Davina from the African Development Bank. Um, so we're hearing most funding windows are just for up to five years. Um, and the challenge of achieving the transformation needed with these predominantly short funding cycles was raised by all the vulnerable countries at the recent or the March um, Climate and Development Ministerial. So how does this affect achieving a country's 30 year vision as they're, as they're setting out in their long-term strategies? Well, uh, thanks Claire and thanks colleagues from uh, the Gambia for giving us really a, a detailed uh, challenge case on, on what the problem is, uh, really live examples of what they're living. And, uh, and that should give us perspective on what uh, a short-term uh, financing uh, does in not helping uh, the situation. So very specific to uh, uh, answering your question. First of all, we need to understand what is contained in an LTS. In your opening remarks, uh, uh, Claire, you mentioned that uh, we are learning as we go by uh, from what you've done at IED in terms of supporting the Gambia. Uh, there is not much in terms of lessons learned from other countries. Uh, as you rightly said, there's been, been uh, one long-term strategy submitted from the country. And Benin that has also submitted a short-term uh, uh, strategy. Now, uh, what that does is uh, long-term strategies uh, are awarded with long-term 
words, uh, things like long-term vision, goals related to sustainable development and climate action around sectoral pathways. So there is already an embedded uh, 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 duration of action that it is towards transitioning to, to uh, uh, the next 40 years. And so what, uh, what we see here is that uh, uh, finance has to have that projection uh, or pathway uh, uh, arrangement uh, in it. And, uh, but uh, that has not happened in the financial sector. It is still very traditional uh, that a loan, uh, payment of a loan uh, is, uh, of course, especially on uh, uh, high indebted countries, is going to be a short term. And, uh, and, and so that, there is a mismatch already there. And, uh, and so I think what we need to spend time on is to understand why an LTS is important. Uh, and, and I wish to outline some of that. One is that uh, an LTS increases political consensus on long-term direction, making it easier to, uh, to plan uh, for the short term in the five-year cycles of indices and in the medium term. And uh, you will all uh, appreciate that when the first indices were, were designed, in fact, starting with INDCs, most of them were uh, not documents that had deep analytics or uh, economy-wide uh, modeling. And what that was, they were not a functional documents. Uh, an investor could not pick an NDC, and it makes uh, sense to them. And so there was a missed opportunity there uh, uh, with the revised and improved indices. Uh, uh, we have a chance to correct that. Uh, but uh, the issue then becomes when you have a mismatch of finance and, and strategy, how do you rectify that? And, and uh, uh, so that, uh, I'll come back to that. Let me, let me just uh, uh, complete where I see the importance and what we need to to kind of really internalize why LTSs are important uh, to invest in and to, in, to ensure that uh, they're well uh, uh, they, they're well studied, developed, and uh, and designed. The other thing is uh, we've all the argument generally is that public finance is not going to cut it. There has to be private sector financing to to cover the bulk of uh, the the cost of uh, uh, transitioning. Uh, all regions, Africa included, towards the net zero and climate resilient uh, trajectory. So, uh, and the private sector uh, has to have a long term signal uh, uh, to be incentivized to increase confidence on the pricing of risks around innovations uh, that are necessary towards the, the, the climate goal, uh, especially in emerging markets, because uh, uh, if you take Africa, the bulk of its infrastructure is, is yet to be uh, uh, built. That means without a long-term strategy, you can't have really clarity on how much is going to be needed uh, at the sector level, later on at the, an, an economy level. So there's going to be need uh, uh, to, to, to create that confidence for the private sector flows uh, 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 to have the confidence to, to, to invest. and. Uh, and uh, lastly, uh, with the long-term strategies, uh, what we've seen clearly is the countries that have clear long-term uh, path and pipeline that accompany them, uh, of course, the bigger economies on the continent, have attracted more uh, international climate finance, or uh, let's say the GCF, uh, I think colleagues in Zambia mentioned that, that oftentimes, even with the 50-50 uh, uh, break, you're going to find that uh, most of that is going to the economies that already have the right infrastructure, the right policies in place uh, that uh, anchor these interventions. They have the right pipeline, they have the, the, the right uh, investor mix that makes it easier uh, for, for the, uh, the asset owners uh, uh, to, to now uh, invest. And so uh, what we need to look at is then how do you de-risk it, how do you uh, create that enabling environment that there is, we create, uh, there is an LTS for a, for, for a country like uh, uh, Gambia that speaks to what uh, the capital owners want to hear, both private and, and, uh, and uh, uh, public. And, and so that's, uh, so to answer your question is, uh, 
the, uh, the lack of, uh, of uh, long-term finance, which is very traditional in, our, in, the, uh, in the financial sector, and, and that's something we are trying to work on, that uh, climate finance, global, uh, the finance from the global funds like GCF and GEF are not going to be enough. There is need to reach out to the real owners of assets, they, and this is also uh, matched with the growing uh, uh, collisions, global collisions around net zero alliances. What, what is happening is those alliances will need uh, a new uh, market to invest. And so this is really a, an opportunity for emerging markets like our continent to present uh, 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 funding opportunities for these uh, resources that are now looking for a new home because they have targets in their uh, commitments towards uh, net zero. I'll, I'll end with an example on the uh, Great Green Wall initiative. So the Great Green Wall is an initiative to, to green the entire, across uh, uh, Africa, the entire Sahara Desert, uh, over 8,000 kilometers from uh, 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 Senegal to Djibouti, the entire belt of it. And uh, that was started in 2007. And its long-term financing required is about three, $33 billion to achieve uh, the, the ambitions of the Great Green Wall uh, by uh, 2030. So uh, that gives clarity that uh, uh, if you have financing for five years, that is not going to create the, uh, the 8,000 kilometers needed for the Great Green Wall initiative. And so there has to be uh, uh, through both domestic and, and, and foreign capital, find a mechanism uh, to de-risk uh, uh, both uh, uh, private sector resources that enable for these uh, 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 results uh, of such transformative initiatives like the uh, Great Green Wall Initiative to be, uh, to be achieved. And, uh, and so how that can happen is through uh, financing from uh, 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 um, uh, multilateral development banks, such as ourselves and the World Bank, that are on this call, but largely from also uh, the private sector. A lot of those net zero alliances that have uh, trillions, nine trillion dollars, and assets under management, that is the kind of space that we need to be engaging. So uh, let me stop here and uh, happy to uh, discuss this later. Thank you. Thank you so much, Davina. Well, that's a very positive story that, um, that you are finding ways to de-risk for the domestic and, and foreign um, investors. Um, and I guess this is, that is really central to um, beginning to solve these longer term opportunities. But when a country is indebted, mm, we still need to find ways of making it a more attractive proposition. So Neha, could we ask you the same question? If most funding windows are for around five years, and yet we know the transformation um, that's needed requires um, longer term investments. And we heard about that from the Climate Development Ministerial in March. Um, how, how can we begin to support countries achieve their 30 year vision that they set out in their long term strategies? Um, Neha, please. Thank you. Thank you, Claire, for that question. And also, I think a lot has been covered by the speakers uh, so far. And some of my uh, points would you know, uh, be sort of reinforcing what we've heard already. But, you know, going back to the fundamental point raised earlier in the discussions uh, with our speakers from the countries. So climate change is not just a challenge of mitigation or adaptation. We're talking about a fundamental systemic risk to growth, to development. It's, it's about uh, as much about, uh, you know, growth and development and planetary health and our human existence. So if we look at that from that perspective, then all systems need to be aligned to be contributing towards climate action. And there is strong you know, commitment and increasing ambition from countries for climate action, but still the, uh, the progress, as you highlighted, towards uh, decarbonization and resilient development has still been slow. And as we heard, you know, the key fundamental challenges we're hearing is access and availability to finance. And of course, the social aspect of it, inclusive climate action that contributes to inclusive development. So 
from, from, from where we, we work and to, together with the countries, what we're seeing is mainstreaming climate change as countries are working towards uh, in, in terms of their economy-wide, whole of society approach, not just incremental sectoral actions, but looking at their national planning, their uh, medium-term budget planning and long-term development plans is very critical. And this is important not just to align public finance sources and external uh, development finance, but also sending the right market signal from the finance for the financial sector for the investors to make sure you know those flows are aligned with uh, climate priorities, national development priorities, which are not different, especially in the context of uh, in LDCs, they're not different from climate priorities, and that's very important. So in the recent years, what we have seen is the dialogue has been shifting from just the mitigation and adaptation priorities to uh, more what are what how these uh, how climate poses a risk physical risks and transition risks to the economy and that narrative has really helped resonate with the financial system of the economy so we're talking about ministries of finance we're talking about uh, and national planning agencies, central banks, investors that further, you know, send the right signal for uh, our for uh, for the financial uh, system and financial architecture working domestically and uh, externally. So going back in terms of how you know these short term windows and long term finance need to be aligned with priorities with climate priorities from the institution side as well. Just like countries are working on embedding this in their planning, economic planning priorities from the institution, financial institution side as well, this means embedding this into the DNA of how the institution operates and delivers finance. For example, let's say in case of development banks, as in World Bank is an example, climate is part of how we are working on our development priorities. The World Bank recognizes climate poses the risks to its twin objectives of ending extreme poverty and shared prosperity. Now, when you start with that and then have climate change uh, action plan as part of our, oper of, of our engagement, both the supply side when uh, making resources available and the delivery side working with countries on engagement, both prioritize climate. So climate action automatically starts emerging as priority aligned with development action. So that's how that's how we're and this this commitment and ambition is increasing uh, with the uh, with the institutional commitments as well. Now, in term and what's most important is that sends the signals both to from where from as the finances as the resources are being allocated for uh, to be uh, channeled through the development banks and also how development banks deliver this. So whether in terms of uh, you can, leveraging development bank resources or helping countries leverage their scarce public finance resources to attract more private sector finance, because we heard public finance is not enough. Scarce public resources with competing development priorities and climate events that further contribute and aggravate the challenge of debt sustainability. That puts countries in a cycle where we're still trying to you know, tackle the climate challenge with limited resources we have uh, with multiple challenges. So with that, we're working with countries on how uh, climate action materializes, of course, at the sectoral level, but at the same time, how the financial system can be aligned to send the right signals to crowd in more external finance. Climate finance, external climate finance, again, availability is limited, but we need to use it strategically to crowd in more of the external finance. And I guess my, my, my last point uh, in terms of wrapping up this response would be, you know, countries are working really hard on developing their long-term strategies. And what we need to make sure is these are not developed just as a uh, part of the climate process, climate negotiations process, but they truly are adopted and embedded as part of their national planning and uh, uh, national planning activities, uh, economic planning activities, and for especially sending the signals to the financial system and the markets. 
Thank you, Neha. Okay, so we, we need to crowd in the private investment is what we're hearing again and again. I'm, I'm nervous that this is harder for the LDCs than for some other countries. But um, let's let's go now to, to Cynthia um, from the um, World Resources Institute. How would you um, how would you consider um, what you know? What are the actions that we can be taking to ensure that the least long term strategies are more than just a report? And how can access to finance um, play into that? Thanks for the question. Very happy to be on this panel and, and happy to have to follow on some of the, the previous discussions. Um, I agree wholeheartedly with some of the points Neha just made around, um, you know, this is not an obligation. This is something that's an invitation to countries to undertake. And I think it's really important to think about, um, you know, how, what the, how, how the country can get the most out of this process. And I really liked uh, Davina's point as well about using long-term strategies as a means to reconcile or address some of the mismatch between uh, finance and, and financial planning and, and uh, climate strategy. And I think it's, it's quite important that the long-term strategies are embedded into the country context and the policy making setting and really set those strong linkages to near-term implementation so that you're able to use the strategy as a tool to guide decisions that are being made today. And just from a, a practical perspective, I think some of these linkages can be formed in a few different ways um, during the, the, the planning and preparation of a long-term strategy, including by setting very clear interim milestones, uh, building strong linkages to the country's nationally determined uh, contribution and existing national development plans. In some cases, there may be advantages to preparing those types of documents in tandem, where you're actually uh, looking at development priorities for, um, you know, for economic development planning at the same time as considering uh, longer term climate objectives. Uh, taking the time to really recognize and think through critical sectors where rapid implementation will be needed and setting sectoral targets and milestones within your long-term strategy is another way. Um, and then also being very clear on priority actions that can be taken early on, and making sure those are part of your long-term strategy. It's also important to help ensure the document itself is robust and can live on beyond the government administration that's drafting it. I think that's one critical way to ensure um, it doesn't just remain a report sitting on a shelf. And in our analysis of some of the long-term strategies that have been prepared to date, there are a few insights that we have identified. Um, the first being that some degree of legal status, if possible, can really strengthen a long-term strategy. And this can be simply a legal requirement to prepare or revise a strategy, or um, you know, you're also seeing a growing number of countries formally adopting their long-term quantitative emission reduction targets, so their net zero targets. Um, and I think it's important for countries that are in a position to do so, to really consider um, embedding some of this in legal format, because it does impose obligations on current and future governments to pursue policies that are in line with the target. Um, also during the planning process, robust and transparent stakeholder engagement cannot be uh, underscored enough and really engaging all of the critical stakeholders during the design phase for the long-term strategy, but also throughout the timeframe for implementation. Uh, it's really important to make sure that you're taking into consideration different voices to build a unified view on what the long-term future is for the country and um, bringing stakeholders into the process to discuss solutions to really difficult challenges. This, the transformations that need to occur are not going to be easy. There are going to be uh, many people that may be negatively impacted by certain types of transitions and it's important that they're part of the, the conversation, um, not only to build support for the vision, but ultimately to build support for the policy decisions that have to align with that vision. Um, and then uh, just another point to note as well, we're seeing a lot of uh, countries are including very specific um, points in their long-term strategies around monitoring, review, and revision. It's just a way to help keep the document relevant and um, ensuring that you have an opportunity to revisit as new developments occur. 
And I think just on a final note on your, your point around um, uh, access to finance and the, the relevance of finance, I think what we've seen in many cases is that a lot of these processes, these steps that you would need to take to make sure that your long-term strategy is robust um, are not always uh, considered when you're actually developing a, you know, a short-term plan to produce a long-term strategy or you're securing a small grant to produce a long-term strategy. And it's really um, critical that some of these aspects are considered. It's perhaps easier to secure financial support to do a technical analysis and develop scenarios and pathways, um, uh, you know, or exploratory modeling to really figure out how the country can transition uh, on a low emissions development path to 2050. Um, but it's also important to consider as part of that process, a way to ensure you have robust stakeholder uh, engagement and you have the, the you know, financial support to ensure um, all of the, the government uh, participants can fully engage. So thank you. Thank you so much, Cynthia. The really, really um, sage advice there. I think this, um, this point particularly, um, I mean, the legal status obviously has huge value um, in keeping the attention through changing governments. Um, but that role of stakeholder engagement to resolve trade-offs, I think it has to be one of the most fundamental um, reasons for doing a long-term strategy that can get that sort of cross-party buy-in, cross-society buy-in um, in the first place. Um, so um, let's go back now to the Gambia. Um, I'd, I'd really like to hear more from Isatu and Alpha. Um, given the challenges you set out and given the responses you've heard to date, what do you think the international community um, can do to support your efforts in the Gambia? What, what improvements, what changes would you look for? Um, Isatu, would you like to take the floor? Thank you once again, Claire. Um, I would first like to begin by emphasizing the Gambia's strong commitment to meeting the Paris Agreement goal. And this has been demonstrated by the first and second NDCs that the country had formulated, um, both of which are rated as Paris um, Agreement compliant. Um, in addition to these two documents, um, a strategic program for climate resilience has been, um, and as well as um, long-term climate vision have been developed. And currently we are working on a long-term climate strategy. Um, aside from the development of these documents, um, the government is committed to providing local resources to address the climate crisis and where possible had contracted loans to address climate change. Um, examples of which include a big nourishment project to combat sea level rise because we had been greatly affected by sea level rise and even now. Um, so government contracted um, a $20 million loan from the African Development Bank to um, push the sea backward, but it seems that um, solution was a adaptation malpractice because the issue is coming back again. Um, besides that as well, um, most recently, um, a, re a, renewable, a renewable energy um, project of 142 million euros um, was contracted as well. Um, majority of which about 65 million was loaned from the European Investment Bank. Um, and this was meant to power 1,000 public schools and 100 public health centers, both of which I believe will, will and may contribute to the country's debt distress in some way. So therefore, um, I believe um, the Gambia has been trying to do its fair share to combat climate change, but international support has been insufficient or inadequate to address our objectives. As a result, in answering your question, um, I would like to see an increase in resources to assist the Gambia in transitioning to a low emission and climate resilient development. I'll pause here and allow Alpha to add or give some input. Thank you. Thank you, it's a very clear message indeed. And the, the need for grants and the need for more resources. Um, please. Um, have we saw Alpha? It seems to have dropped off my screen. Yeah, thank you, Claire, and then thank you, S2, for uh, those additional information to the question. First, I just want to um, answer first the first, second part of the first questions. 
where we are in, uh, in the formation of our LTS. Uh, to answer that, we, have, uh, we are progressing well with the support from the 2050 pathway. We have recruited the national coordinator who's working uh, with support and support from the ministry and myself uh, to, uh, to finalize the governance structure of the LTS. And now we are working to finalize the, uh, the TOR for the consultant in a firm or, 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 or an individual. And then also uh, once that one is, uh, is finalized, then we will uh, we will finalize in the, uh, the the work plan with all the cost. We have just submitted to the 2050 pathway the first two drafts, and we are waiting for their inputs of uh, inputs and contribution to it so that we can finalize it. It is expected to to last for six months uh, to be completed and submitted to to government. And now coming back to your second questions, I think of the improved funding from the, the donor communities and what we, 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 we anticipate, anticipate from the donor continent, uh, communities is one first, uh, as the, uh, the, I think the panelists from the African Development Bank, we need to develop our LTS with details, explanation of, of how we want it to be implemented. And then not only of how we want it to be implemented, but maybe breaking it in, in stages in every 10 years or five years, what we want to achieve, that is the milestone and the cost of those milestones uh, or cost of those milestones and how we can achieve them. And secondly, uh, to improve funding and the, the window for funding is to align our LTS with our development, uh, development initiative, like, like the vision and also the national development plan. The vision is already completed and submitted to cabinet for improvement and the LTS is expected to implement to provide guidance for the implementation of the, the vision, and uh, on which we will also anticipate and, and, and envisage support from the, the, the financing communities. And also, we will also want their flexibility and, uh, and, and acknowledging that our development, uh, our development needs is also linked to climate development needs. They are all together. And for that flexibility, it will help us to improve on the funding and also and, and also uh, and uh, and also implement more on our climate pledges. And as it has already indicated, our commitment to implement an ambitious and robust NDC, which put us almost on the almost on the on the chart in the world, and uh, we will need funding to implement it. And we have engaged the, the, the donor committees in the country here as to where, as to how they can uh, they can assist us implement the NDC. So to answer it short, uh, in short, is, the, is uh, to engage the, uh, the donor community furthermore, and also uh, for, the, for the donor uh, community to be flexible in providing the uh, providing funding to, uh, for the implementation of our climate investment as, uh, as in our SPCR, which is also a blueprint document which outlines the climate investment for the country, which also linked to the climate change policy. And, uh, and having all those in place, I think we have created the, uh, the, uh, the enabling environment to, uh, to allow climate investment in this country with donor funding. One aspect is clear that uh, with, with the renewables, I think we can engage the private sector because they, for them it's dollar in and dollar out and what is the profit. But for adaptation of the senior building, it's going to be very difficult to engage the private sector because Adaptation is very difficult to, to make profit on adaptation of projects or adaptation initiative. Knowing that uh, you may also have uh, loss and damages, you may invest on adaptation today and tomorrow. If one, one event can come, a disaster, and it will all be eroded. So that is why that's why it is difficult to engage the private sector in adaptation in initiative of the senior building. So just to add what I should have said, in, in, uh, apart from the coastal. The concept of protection that is the suit nourishment initiative. We are working further with the UNDP on one of our streams that allow drainage water to flow into the ocean, which is blocked by debris and also uh, and with sedimentation is to drain to, to drink it and open it. And we are working with the World Bank on that project and it's called the Koto, the Koto Stream uh, uh, Development Project. And uh, with that, I think I can stop here for further answers or for further questions. That I can elaborate on. Back to Clara. Thank you so much, Alpha. Um, and some really important points you're making there around um, the need for flexible flexibility of the finance. 
to build that your domestic enabling environment and the ways in which you can check um, private investors for some areas, but not others, particularly harder for adaptation or loss and damage. So Davina, can I come to you now again and ask um, from the perspective of the African Development Bank, when, when um, uh, these countries are trying to put into place the institutional arrangements that they need, whether that's a new institution or strengthening an existing one, um, to begin to drive the policies around the long-term strategies, um, how can development partners support building this homegrown capability? Um, I'm going to have to ask you to be really brief. Each of you now is going to have to speak very briefly so we've got some time for, um, for some of the questions that are coming in. Yeah, uh, thanks, Claire. Indeed, I'll, I'll try to be brief and start with uh, uh, however good the LTSS might be or the institutional framework is at a local level. The, the funder, the source of capital, has to do some aligning in a way that then they're intentional on investment. Indeed, as we talk of long-term uh, finance, through the boardrooms of our institutions, there has to be intention that that's the direction uh, their capital has to flow. And so as MDBs, we've committed to uh, alignment, uh, uh, what we call the six uh, building blocks on uh, Paris alignment. And all those six uh, building blocks blocks. We are intentional uh, uh, across on what we are doing. One of them, uh, building block four, specifically talks of supporting uh, uh, national strategies, including NAPs, NDCs, and uh, LTSs. So that is a, a direct uh, uh, or directive around uh, uh, moving finance for that. But with that is also a, a building block six, which looks in ones around changing our uh, systems to enable uh, financing to, to, to such uh, uh, programs and strategies. Because what often happens is uh, our cooperation agreements are still uh, uh, a decade old. Uh, uh, so you will not find uh, uh, climate related interventions funded. What you find is an infrastructure program, uh, uh, education program and all. And so the, any environment or any rated uh, uh, financing is left uh, for grant uh, and uh, technical assistance, which are always small pockets of money. So first, we have we become very intentional about funding these uh, 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 strategies because they are very influential on the flow of finance. Two is we've also uh, moved very clearly on LTSs and have now uh, working on principles uh, of uh, uh, financing LTSs. We have eight uh, 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 proposed principles that include one thing that was mentioned uh, by the uh, Gambian uh, team around capacity, enhancing local capacity. Indeed, uh, as uh, 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 the, I think it was also to the lady from Gambia mentioned a, a maladaptation case of a project that the bank was involved in. Let me just say that why is this? I'm not uh, uh, disputing that it may be a maladaptation. It all comes down to the capacities. Is your feasibility capacity good enough? Are your uh, 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 pre-project uh, analytics good enough? So we are still uh, lacking data. So oftentimes uh, our uh, infrastructures are built on not very good data. So uh, among our principles as MDBs is to deal in that area, especially where it is lacking. So we have uh, principles that look at ownership, that look at inclusiveness, uh, because uh, uh, you have a situation where stakeholders are mapped in certain categories of the population are not included. We are also looking at uh, the convergence of uh, climate and SDGs, because these are not two uh, different processes. And also uh, looking at the whole long-term uh, trajectory. So uh, yeah, these will come out at COP, and uh, and those will be our directional documents around financing LTSs. So yeah, great. That sounds great. <laughs> Looking forward to yeah. seeing those, Davina. I'm super yeah. curious now. They sound quite similar to the principles for locally led adaptation. So hopefully there's some alignment there as well. Um, great. I, that's that's exciting. Neha, from the perspective of the World Bank, the same question to you. Um, how can the international community get better at building the nationally owned homegrown institutions that these countries need to deliver their long-term strategies? Thanks, Claire. 
I think uh, in responding to this question, I'll take a similar approach as done previously. Action needs to happen both uh, internally in the institutions, you know, supporting these efforts, and then also as we are delivering through our country programs to country engagement. Uh, and again, climate needs to be built in not just as part of actions, but also as part of uh, institutional capacity and uh, you know, technical support to build that internal capacity in countries. So how think, some, some examples of how this is envisioned and working out um, from, from an internal institutional perspective, for, for, for example, at the World Bank, you know, as Davina was mentioning, you know, country programs was, as these are designed for MDBs for engagement in different countries. These are uh, grounded on foundations of solid analytics on economic and growth priorities for the countries, social priorities for the countries. What the bank is doing now, and they have introduced a core country climate and development assessment which is called the Country Climate and Development Report, which is similar to the poverty assessment, the macroeconomic assessment of the country, which makes sure that all of these three are embedded together and are used intrinsically in designing country engagement programs. So climate is not an add-on incremental uh, you know, issue that is being brought on in terms of project design, but fundamentally embedded in programs. Now, taking this to implementation, uh, of course, you know, Cynthia also highlighted this earlier, there are a range of technical assistance programs and uh, grant funding associated with that that's available to support countries for training, for capacity building. Uh, and as I was mentioning, you know, at sectoral level that has advanced very well in the past few years, but recently there's more concerted efforts to build that capacity into uh, financial uh, sector, international planning agencies, ministries of finance. So coalition of finance ministers, for example, is one that one kind of uh, one of those examples where bringing in ministers of finance who are working on these subjects and inter and mainstreaming climate change as part of national planning. Similarly, uh, so th that those are examples of technical assistance working with different actors uh, of the country of the system to embed uh, climate um, system systematically. Similarly, in terms of uh, implementation related financing. That's where, uh, you know, of course, we embed this as part of any of our projects that we are working on. Uh, not just, um, it's, it's not just because it's an institutional priority, but it's very clear that the development objectives of most projects will not be met, will be threatened because of climate impact or uh, due to transition risks that the countries face. And last but not the least is, uh, you know, policy support and uh, budgetary support that comes as part of our policy lending to countries, where countries, as these, uh, as countries are developing their uh, updated NDCs and uh, long-term strategies and embedding them into their national planning uh, plan, national development plans, as these go through cabinet approvals and are adopted for implementation, there are uh, instruments that support these policy actions through budgetary support for countries. So those are some examples that I wanted to share today. Thanks. Thank you so much, Neha. Um, and yes, I think I will look very exciting that you're now doing a climate and development report for each country. I wasn't aware of that. So that's really is an advance. Um, and great to hear the different ways in which you're supporting the institutional strengthening of the institutions in country. There's, there's a lot of very rich ideas there. Um, Cynthia, for, for time, I'm gonna come straight to you. Um, in your experience, have countries been including financing needs um, for delivering their long-term strategies? Um, to what extent do you think these long-term strategies should be costed? Um, any thoughts from your side? Thanks for the question. Um, and just to note, I mean, it's still early days. There are only around 33 long-term strategies, and most of them are from developed countries. But what we're seeing uh, in the strategies that have been submitted so far is that there are essentially three general approaches that countries are taking to con consider um, finance in the implementation of their strategies. The first point being uh, many countries are, are using their strategies as an inward looking device. We've found several uh, strategies that actually discuss the financing needs to support a just transition. 
Uh, the European Union references their just transition mechanism, including uh, you know, facilitating 100 billion euros to support effective implementation. Costa Rica also intends to create a job sector plan and funding strategy to support um, sectors most impacted by the transition. The second uh, approach is more outward looking. Several countries do highlight the need for additional international finance. Um, some are more general than others in, in the extent of the finance required, um, but it is definitely something that countries are beginning to talk about. And the third approach is more informational. Several parties uh, do indicate in their long-term strategies that they, they want to use the strategy as a guide for future investment toward a cleaner and more sustainable future. So many countries are really specifying how the targets and the contents uh, of their strategies should be able to inform either um, development plans or you know, preparing future uh, investment strategies or simply to be used as a signal to the private sector. Um, so I think what we're seeing is that there is some degree of costing of uh, scenarios and, and pathways. Um, and I think it's, it's rather important for countries to consider this early on and set the expectation that finance does need to be directed or redirected toward the implementation of the strategy, but also take into account the significant benefits of uh, transformative climate action and really set the, the narrative there. So thank you. Thank you so much. Um, well, okay, so we, we've now got quite a few questions have come from the floor and I feel that we should we should begin to tackle them. Um, um, we have we have a few detailed ones and a few bigger picture ones. So um, I think what I'm going to do is where they're obviously directed at somebody, um, direct them to them. But if you if you want to jump in on an answer, please do. Um, so the first one is for Isutu um, from um, um, Prof uh, JV. Do you have any report and link um, on your experience on financing for Gambia since 2014? Um, and what would be the transitional strategy from 2030 to 2050? Uh, what is the disaster risk reduction strategy through 2050 in the Gambia? So basically just asking you how will your, um, your, your disaster, your um, development and your, your long-term vision um, come together, I think. It's a two. Thank you, Claire, and thank you, Professor Fick. Professor, for that next one. <laughs> I can't go around it, sorry. <laughs> um, with regards to the first question, yes, uh, we ha I have some reports, um, mainly policy briefs um, to support climate change financing in the Gambia. Um, the first one had um, highlighted some policy pointers, which included um, establishing a climate change fund and creating a climate change budget code. Um, after upon publishing that um, policy brief, which was um, published by IIED, the country uh, I'm, I'm proud to say now have established a adaptation, sorry, a climate change fund, which is yet to be um, operational, but it has established one and it was identified as something that the country needs in our national climate change um, policy. And the budget code is also um, seen uh, something that the country needs in order to able to track um, um, local resources um, to, to address climate change. So it's yet, the process is, has started. Um, I think um, concept notes have been developed to ensure that we have this and capacity is needed at the Ministry of Finance as well to enable us to have a climate change budget code. So maybe we would need to learn from experience of, I guess, Nepal. Had, Nepal has a climate change budget code, so we would need to learn experience from those countries. Um, with regards to his second question, he talked about disaster risk reduction strategy. Um, by 2050, um, the, what I know is um, the office that's responsible for disaster risk reduction strategy um, or the agency um, has developed, had developed one. I think in 2019 or so, but that strategy is up to 2030 um, because they try to link it to the Sandai, Sandai framework, which is up to 2030, so it's not up to 2050. So, but in that policy, key climate um, hazards, which um, are frequent flooding that, I, that usually happens in the Gambia, and now we are seeing 
wind breaks happening frequently as well. Um, these and droughts as well, because with that agency, they are um, participating in a disaster um, risk transfer um, mechanism with the African Development Bank to um, insure the country in case we have a drought. So they are implementing those as well. So for now, um, the, that um, strategy is trying to address these emerging issues. For example, um, the windbreak that I have talked about in recently or this year, um, we had a we had a very serious one that had never happened before, and we unfortunately lost lost ten lives. So this um, policy, climate um, disaster reduction trust we is trying to address these major climate um, hazards or climate events in the Gambia. So I'll stop that. I I hope I answered his question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Um, yeah, can I also clear? Can please, I add Alpha, something to, please. Yeah, in, in addition to what she said, I would just want to add that we are also thinking of having a climate change act. Because if you have all the all the policies and the codes, you need an act, even the, for the climate change to function legally uh, or efficiently, you need an act to back it up. And if you need green bonds or, or, or emission or, or, or emission charges, you need a climate change act to enforce, to, to enforce that. So we are also thinking around <clears throat> to have a climate change act. Secondly, we also have a disaster action plan at regional level. So at region, we have a coordinator. They have a, what they we call multidisciplinary working groups, which are also at regional level. And each coordinator has an, an action plan for the region with, uh, on, on which to implement their disaster action plans. So these are the two, uh, two things that I want to add to what uh, she has said. Back to you. Thank you so much. Um, and Alpha, the, the next question um, I was thinking of directing to you, but others also feel free to jump in. Um, it's a question from Zakir in Bangladesh. What might be the role of local people in planning and acting, um, in, and in, sorry, in planning and action? for long-term climate resilience strategies. So the role of local people in, in this. Well, as, as we are about to develop our long-term strategy, what we will do is a nationwide consultation and which will involve local people and make sure that their thoughts and their ideas and their initiatives are included in the long-term strategy. And in the NAPS also, which we are, uh, we are develop, about to develop, also, we, we ensure that uh, their, their needs and aspirations and risks are also taken care of in the NAPS formulation. So uh, in short, as we are going to develop do, do these two important documents, we will consult as much as possible local, local people to ensure that their needs and their aspirations are highlighted and included in this long-term strategy. And that's going to be their role in it. They have to have to got a very key and important role in the formulation of these documents. I hope I answered this question. That's great. Thank you very much, Alpha. Um, if anyone else wants to respond, just click your um, your video on so that I know that you're interested in the question. Um, I just I wondered actually on that one whether there was a, a connection with um, the LDC Initiative for Effective Adaptation and Resilience, which the Gambia is also a front runner um, in, which is about getting finance down to the local level behind communities' um, priorities. I don't know. It's to Alpha whether you've got any views on that. Yeah, uh, thank you for that uh, second question. Uh, we are a bit behind in the LTC uh, in the life AR initiative because we are very keen on the ground with myself and assistant with all other uh, works and activities on the ground like the vision uh, and now the LTS is uh, consuming much of our time. But uh, in, uh, in, in implementing like AR, because adaptation implementation is actually should happen at the community level. And we, we ensure that uh, uh, they are involved in, in, in the life AR. We have already uh, had a first meeting under the life AR of which to identify stakeholders and also focal points across the country. But we are yet to set, to set the, 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 the platform itself, which will include also uh, up to regional level so that they will know what life AR is and when it comes to implementation they'll be, they'll be active, uh, active in the 
in the implementation of the life AR activities. Back to you. Thank you so much. Okay, so the, the next Can I um, add something? Oh yes, please, apologies. All right. Yeah, I just wanted to add a point that um, Alpha's point is valid, but I think they have um, made some few um, progress progress because the climate change policy and which um, has highlighted the need for us to have a climate change fund, which we have already established um, when it's operational, um, that fund in the um, climate change policy had um, directed or given the, have uh, provided the emphasis that 50% of the resources that would be, um, that would be received by the fund would be directed directed to local communities. So I think that would support the Life ER initiative, which is talking about having 70% of the funds directed to local communities. So I think as a country, we would need to see if we need to revise that to 70% or we want to maintain the 50% that was in, in, the, in our vision. That's what I, want, what I wanted to add. Thank you. But, thanks, thanks EC2. Yeah, I can see that that'd be um, an important area to discuss. Um, okay, so the next question is around um, the role of blended finance in facilitating long-term strategy delivery. Um, I wonder if my colleagues from the banks would like to jump in on this one. Um, keep in mind, of course, the challenges of getting private finance investment interested in the adaptation side. Um, do you see blended finance as, as um, an important role for um, these strategies financing? Neha. Thanks, Claire. I think that's a very important point and area that's uh, you know, starting to get more traction. First of all, they're stepping back you know, on finance itself, since we started out with the discussion on how scarce public finances, by itself, we wouldn't be able to meet the objective. So blending it with different types of resources to make it more attractive for investments is certainly going to be important. And when we were talking about private finance, it's not just private finance, discrete investments at project level, but we're looking at a market, you know, shifting the market, sending the signal. So, so it becomes more easier to have a more long-term uh, vision and long-term financing available. Now, blended finance, both in terms of taking concessional resources from climate and blending it with other development finance resources, of, or more importantly, taking concessional resources to actually leverage external market uh, finance is going to be important. So the idea basically is to create an additional stream of uh, financing that is not just limited to government's own resources and uh, or the scarce development resources that countries are tapping into. And that's where uh, you know, there are instruments on carbon financing, carbon pricing instruments that countries are starting to look, are looking into more actively to create that additional stream of revenues to complement and to, you know, to also help alleviate some of the fiscal pressures that they are facing internally within their economy. Similarly, tapping into markets, as we heard from Alpha regarding, you know, going to markets through green bonds, sustainable finance access that requires an underpinning of policy and enabling environment, which you know, needs to be set up to help tap into those markets. So certainly there is no doubt in the long run, you know, given the scarce public resources and scarce development finance and increasing demands for these resources, we will need to complement these. Now, the, the, the challenge is in identifying what works in different country contexts, given you know, whether there's carbon intensive actors, carbon intensive, players that could be contributing to a carbon pricing scheme, or there are more external investors to be brought in through financial markets that would be that that have the appetite and interest to invest in these uh, green investments. Thank you. Thank you, Neha. Devina, have you got anything you want to add to? Yes. And, uh... Uh, just to say that, uh, as Neha has uh, described uh, the process, that uh, I, I wanted to, to just uh, uh, give some examples of where it has worked uh, mm -hmm. jointly uh, between ourselves, the World Bank, and other multi-MDBs uh, in bilateral funds. 
were able to create the, the world's first uh, concentrated solar uh, uh, plant in uh, Morocco, Wazazat. That was made possible uh, because of blended finance. So the, 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 the opportunities that uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, blended finance brings on board is to de-risk uh, innovation. And, uh, and even closer to uh, as recent as last year when we had the uh, COVID uh, uh, pandemic situation, because of the liquidity uh, 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 stress on uh, some of the private sector operations, what uh, uh, the bank came up with solutions. We have a facility called the Sustainable Energy Fund for Africa that kind of looks at solutions for the SME or middle-level uh, middle uh, uh, capital uh, uh, private operators. And, and, uh, and so there was a, a blended finance called uh, off-grid uh, COVID-19 uh, solutions. And what that does was to provide a 20 million uh, facility to, a, a fund, uh, to fund managers that were championing that that then uh, creates some easiness on the balance sheets of the investors because of the, of the uh, COVID uh, impacts. So uh, what I'm trying to say, uh, there are solutions, uh, tailored uh, interventions as uh, financial products that then alleviate, uh, especially around risks of innovation. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Doreena. Really, really helpful. Um, so um, the next question is from Jill Matthews and, and a, a, a challenging one for us all. Um, are we tackling the problem from the wrong end? Um, is, is the market-based economic system not actually what's been driving the challenges we've been facing? And should we be charging um, tax um, for using the natural environment? So charging companies and corporates for their use of the natural environment. Um, again, I feel this might be best answered by my colleagues in the banks. Davina, do you want to have a go at that first? Yeah, uh, in the, uh, I think uh, maybe just to re uh, allay Matthew's fears uh, is that the private, sorry, the civil society has been very active. Just like during the tobacco campaigns, there has been a lot of uh, putting the spotlight where it is deserved. We've seen uh, what they did, the negative publicity around coal. Uh, and that has driven divestitures that, that you see a, a really trend of divestitures from fossil fuels. We saw what they did with uh, uh, large hydros. And, uh, and it is a matter of what's this momentum uh, from the awareness campaign, then uh, you start to see uh, investors, because ultimately is these things are happening because there's a source of financing. And once uh, the, the, the Funders are targeted uh, because there's a loss of capital. There's a lot of uh, stranded assets that come with these kind of uh, uh, interventions. And, and so where there has been targeted uh, uh, negative publicity, especially from uh, the, the campaigners, we've seen a shift. And that shift uh, moves capital. Uh, it's not enough, but it's a positive uh, signal. That's what I can say. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else want to come in on that last question? No? Okay. So then I think um, we're coming towards the end. Um, I don't know if there's any other further questions coming in, but um, my handy supporter hasn't put any in. So wh what I might do then is just begin to wrap up. So first of all, I think we should all be congratulating the Gambia on having the only 1.5 degree aligned NDC and their hugely impressive long-term vision, which is the start of them setting out their long-term strategy. And by the sounds of it, Alpha, further, further leadership with the potential Climate Change Act coming down the road. Um, it was really heartening to hear the intentions from the African Development Bank and the um, World Bank um, around uh, aligning and supporting these long-term strategies, getting behind um, the domestic capability, building that capability across government. Um, I'm, I'm really curious to see these eight principles for financing long-term strategies and look forward to the COP greatly to be able to see what those are about and how they align with some of the other um, in the other approaches to trying to get climate finance to really work for the poorest countries. I think the um, 
uh, having a climate and development assessment by the World Bank for each country is also an important, um, an important innovation. We also heard some really important lessons from other um, long-term strategies. Um, uh, and um, yeah, Cynthia's sort of insights from actually how to, how to give these long-term strategies real uh, legal um, uh, positioning in order to ensure that they, they remain being updated and, and, and continue to have a life. Um, the, the value of these for, for beginning to um, think through the financing and to signal to the private sector, we heard about from a few um, speakers also. Um, and we also were hearing about um, uh, the need for increased grant finance, for greater grant climate finance, um, but the, the limits of development finance um, being very real, how different countries are looking at creating new streams through the carbon markets or elsewhere, green bonds to leverage greater investment, and the role of um, um, that rather limited public finance to de-risk innovation through blended finance um, approaches. So altogether, it's, it felt um, a very rich discussion. I'd really like to thank my panelists again for um, their, their um, time. Isitu Kamara from the Gambia, Alpha Jalla also from the Gambia, Davina from um, the African Development Bank, Neha from the World Bank and Cynthia from World Resources Institute. We're really grateful for your time today. It was a really exciting discussion. Thank you all very much indeed.